Ah, whakatau mai rā, whakatau mai rā. Whakatika tika ki te ora, whakatika tika ki te pai. E mana, he reo, ki a tukua, ki a puta. Au e he mamai, au e he aroha, au e taukari e. Uh, ki hei mauri ora. So that tauparapara that I've just used uh, is a bit of a welcome uh, to give goodness and life and also kindness to each other and saying that there is potency in the things that we say to make them happen. And whilst it might be painful, uh, it might also show some compassion. And so these are the things that we know. Ka whakamihi au i tēnei whare, te whenua e tū ana, me te moana kei tōra tōna Taha, ka mihi hoki a hau ki ngā tāngata, ki ngā mā tauranga, ki ngā maharatanga, me ngā taonga e mau nei i tēnei whare. He mihi ana hau ki te mana whenua. And so it made, uh, my, 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 my talk was made a little easier uh, because Will has already Acknowledged, acknowledge the mana whenua me te uh, ma, uh, ngā hapu o tēnei rohe. Mihi mai, mihi mai, mihi mai ra. So I acknowledge this house, the land on which it stands, and the sea beside it. I also acknowledge the people, the knowledge, the memories and the treasures that this house holds. And I have extended my greetings to Kaitahu. E te tumuaki o, o tākau whaka ihu waka, te honore, Grant Robinson, te nā koe e ho. And thank you for joining us to speak this evening. E te iwi, kia ora koutou, a tēnā tātou katoa e hui hui mai nei, i te kaupapa o tēnei hui, no mai haere mai, and greetings to you all. So I'm Jerry Mataparai, privileged to be here as the chair of Healthier Lives, He Oranga Hauora, together with, and this is my introduction, Dr. Will Edwards, chair of Aging Well, ki a eke kairangi ki te tau, uh, tai tau matua tanga, and in the position of kicking off this hui on behalf of the governance groups and the management teams of Healthier Lives and Aging Well. And I am delighted to welcome you all here this evening. I do want to acknowledge uh, our host, the University of Otago, and the collaborating partners for both um, Healthier Lives and Aging Well. So I'll start with my alma mater, uh, the University of Waikato, uh, Massey University, <laughs> University of Auckland. You know, I did mention Otago first, haven't you? Just, <laughs> <laughs> University of Canterbury, uh, Victoria University and Auckland University of Technology, Ag Research, CRESA, ESR and the Maligan Institute. Uh, my task this evening is a simple one and it's in two parts. Uh, first of all, I'll run through some health and safety and housekeeping matters. I'll introduce the Vice-Chancellor and then to explain the purpose of the event and what we're hoping to achieve. And to set the scene, I'll mention a couple of things which I think are important about healthier lives. Co-governance, our focus on uh, research implementation pathways and our support for research teams. I'll then introduce another person who doesn't need much of an introduction in this, in this place, the Director of Healthier Lives, uh, Professor Jim Mann, and then Dr Karen Bartholomew, <clears throat> who's speaking on behalf of Professor Sue Kringle. I'll then hand over to, to Will. Um, and just as a point, there are going to be four presentations today. Um, can I ask that you 
leave questions until the end of the four talks. So, safety and housekeeping notices. Uh, just a reminder to you to turn off or put on to silent your cell phones. Uh, in the event of an emergency, we'll evacuate down the main stairwell, the one that we came up, out the front door and congregate at the Albany Street bus stop at the front of the museum. In the event of an earthquake, and not the Alpine Fault one, I hope, <coughs> please stay away from any windows, so we're okay. Find cover, drop cover hold, and remain there until the tremors uh, have finished. In terms of Wharipaku bathrooms, there's some directly outside of the theatre, and more downstairs to the left of the stairs. So the second part, what I think have been some of the defining features, and hoping not to steal any of Jim's uh, uh, points that he, he's going to cover later. Firstly, co-governance. Healthy Lives was the first National Science Challenge to adopt a co-governance model in October 2016. And I do want to acknowledge my predecessor, Jenny, who initiated our co-governance journey. Our experience of co-governance has been overwhelmingly positive, enabling us to build the level of trust needed for robust conversations. It's enabled us to sharpen our focus, to have important conversations, and to direct the resources to the most pressing priorities. And in, in, in that, we brought in two outstanding young Māori researchers as interns. Ms. Lara, Lara is one, Lara Greaves, Dr. Lara Greaves, and Dr. Matt um, Williams, who's not here this evening. Secondly, our focus on implementation pathways. Our research teams fully understood the expectation within healthier lives that they would work collaboratively to produce outcomes that are useful for others. From its inception, the challenge has funded research that was genuinely co-designed in partnership with communities. At our Korero Tahi Symposium earlier this year, we launched a report about the lessons that we've learned from this. And the third one is support for research teams. Relationships between people have been important in every facet of the Healthier Lives work. The high level of collegiality that we required of our researchers led to new ways of working, new collaborations, new initiatives, and a sense of shared purpose and commitment. We've put a premium into staying alongside our research projects for their whole lifespan, from the initial identification of research priorities to the design of projects, to completion of the research, and to the dissemination and implementation of results. We have been conscious that some funding models have, research, have researchers often having to chase their next grant, and that sometimes there is no funding available to follow up the work already done to see a project through to implementation. Careful oversight by our director, Jim, and our management team has allowed the capacity to provide top-up funding to extend research, address unplanned contingencies, and support the dissemination and translation of findings. <coughs> That's enough from me for now. Uh, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce the Honourable Grant Robertson, the Vice Chancellor of this <laughs> university. Right. Oh, tī hei Māori ora, uh, hei mihi ana uh, nā mana whenua uh, ki tēnei takiwa, uh, kai tahu whānui katoa, uh, waitaha ka te māmoi, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. 
ena mana ena re re ronga tira ma ana ho e fa tena ka to tena ka to tena ka to ka to greetings everybody uh, thank you uh, sujuri tena kwe for that introduction um, it is my great pleasure to be here today um, i see on the sh on the uh, sheet i have 5 minutes and in my previous uh, job when it was a 5 minute speech they rang a bell at the end of the five minutes to make sure I sat down. Um, so if I do go past that, make bell noises. Uh, I really am here today to do two things. The first of those is to say thank you. So I do want to say a genuine and heartfelt thank you to the teams involved in both Healthier Lives and Aging Well. Namahinu ke koto katoa. Thank you to you all. Today is one of those strange days. It's a day of celebration. But it is also, and, and Jerry Spokotoki at the start, he, he talked about this, it is also a day that will be tinged with sadness. And I want to acknowledge both of those emotions in the room today. But I say thank you because you should be so intensely proud of what you have done. When I think about the people who have been involved and are involved in these challenges, it is the very best of us. And I mean that honestly. I'm still slightly scared of Jim Man. <laughs> I used to work for Jim. I suspect I still do. <laughs> but the teams involved in this are the most extraordinary group of people. Now, I will get in trouble if I start naming names, but I will do a few, and then I, and then I will do a more general comment. I do want to obviously acknowledge those who've cheered uh, both of, of them of the uh, challenges. So, Will, um, you, but also your predecessor, Di uh, McCarthy, um, as we've already heard from Z Sir Jerry, um, you, but also your predecessor, Jenny McMahon, as chairs. Um, the governance role here is exemplary. There are lessons for all of us to learn from the way you've gone about governance. I want to acknowledge the governing boards in total and Kai. Kahui Māori who have led and governed these challenges well. That governance has been one of your greatest strengths. But your other strengths obviously are the people inside uh, the two science challenges. David Baxter, Louise Parr Brownlee as directors of, um, of Aging Well, um, Jim as the director of Healthier Lives and all of your teams. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for the work that you have done and for the legacy that you leave. I also want to make a special acknowledgement of the teams who sit behind these challenges. You have some of the best administrators. I know because I stole one. <laughs> <laughs> that group of people have made things tick and made things work, and I think right now we should show our appreciation to them. On my <laughs> On behalf of the University, Otaku Whakaihu Waka, I want to acknowledge what you have brought, the mana that you have brought to our institution. I want to acknowledge our incoming Chancellor, Trish Oakley, who is here today as well. Always good to acknowledge your boss, by the way. <laughs> as a university, we are, have been honoured to host these two challenges, and they have brought a great richness to our institutions, and I want to say thank you for that. I only want to say two more things about why I feel so honoured about that. And this has already been mentioned a little bit by Sujiri. What I think we ask of universities is to be there where the big issues of our times are, where the big challenges of our times are, where the big opportunities of our times are. And that's where these challenges have been. In our society, how we look after an ageing population, how we address inequality, what we do about the big killers of our time, of cancer, of diabetes, of obesity. They are the issues we want our universities to be at the forefront on, and that's what these challenges have done. We ask for collaboration, and we see it here. And we ask for a partnership, and as a university that aspires to a tetariti led university and a partnership, what we see in these challenges is a model for us all to take forward. My final point is this. 
I know that today is a day of mixed emotions, as I said, but the legacy of the work that is here will go on. The people who drove this work will go on. And we will all be the beneficiaries for that extraordinary piece of work. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia kaha, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for your your comments, both um, generally, um, but equally in terms of acknowledging uh, the people that have worked on the two challenges. Um, yeah, because it's it's not for us to tell how sweet we are, <laughs> and it is um, it, it is great to hear it from the Vice Chancellor because the legacy has been developed out of here. Can I just acknowledge one other person, Richard? Uh, can I just acknowledge you for uh, the support that you've given, certainly to us, but I, I guess also to, to Ageing Well. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that Ageing Well, well, healthier lives and Ageing Well are at the mature end of <laughs> the life cycle. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that speaks volumes for what we have been able to do. Uh, you talked about time, and so I'm taking more time than I'm meant to. Uh, and I've also looked at my program, and I realise that I've actually raced ahead of myself, and I should have. But I do want to thank you <laughs> for the time, and also for for your comments, um, Grant. Uh, my next privilege is to introduce. Professor Sir Joel Ivor Mann, Jim Mann. He is a world leader. He is someone whom you know, New Zealand should be exceptionally proud of. And he will give you an idea of why it is when he tells you only a smidgen about what um, he has been able to do together with the governance group, Kahui Māori, and the management team and the, uh, the support team with Healthier Lives. You know, he's, he's authored over 500 peer-reviewed journals and articles and written so many more. Jim. Ko Afrika ki te toka o te papa te whenua i tipu ake o kei i karangi. Kei te noho o kei Aotipoti e nai anei, ko Jim toka e koa. I have been given an enormous brief and I've been told to be brief, which I think is extremely unfair. <laughs> I couldn't have resist having a dig at um, somebody. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to use this... <laughs> I get, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to use the short time that I have been allocated to talk briefly about the people involved, the principles and process by which we came to decide how best to contribute to our vision, given our very limited funding. I hope somebody from MB is listening. <laughs> I shall then provide a very brief overview with just a few examples of some of the research and our other activities. And by the way, Sir Jerry, you stole quite a lot of my punchlines. Um, the um, could could we have the the slides on. Do, do am I meant to? Yeah. I can. It should be just an arrow on the end. Yeah. Well, I'm using the different arrows, but ah, there we are. Um, the um, launch. I will go straight on to this one. The launch at Otako Marae on the 4th of December 2015 was a pivotal event in terms of the future of the challenge. The symbolism of being at the Marae was profoundly important, as were the people who were there. A senior government cabinet minister, two members of the university senior leadership team, I'm not going to go through them, you, can, you will spot them, I'm sure. Most of the governance group, researchers represented by the, the science leadership team, but most importantly were those representing the mana whenua, who to some extent also represented stakeholders more widely, and I shall come back to talk more about stakeholders. 
in imp an impassioned speech, and he, oh, sorry, an impassioned speech. Uh, oh, sorry, the things are not so, all that clear. I better give a tutorial to people who are coming after me how to use this. Tuari Portuki, who many of you will know in the bottom panel there, gave an impassioned speech in which he reminded us of the health inequities experienced by Māori and our treaty obligations in this regard. It was also very good to have Maji Apa present, who was standing in for Jenny on that occasion, who was reminded us of the fact that Pacific people in Aotearoa were also subject to tremendous inequities of health care. It was abundantly clear to everybody who was there on that day that while we had responsibilities to work towards reducing the burden of disease associated with the four major non-communicable diseases for all New Zealanders, achieving equity of health outcomes and being responsible to tertiary and our responsibilities to tertiary was absolutely a central consideration for our challenge. And on that particular occasion as director, I made a commitment on behalf of the challenge that this would indeed be the case and that we would report back to the community. Tonight is a part of that process. Um, it is invidious, as people have said, to single out individuals, but I too want to pay my respects to Jenny, who together with Andrew Spall is in the middle there of the bottom row, uh, were really the people who came up with the idea and the concept that we should, we should as a, have a trial for, of co-governance with a kahui Māori being part and parcel and together in co-governance with the governance group. And it has been tremendously successful. I would also really like to acknowledge Tajeri because he has done an extraordinary job together with a governance group, Kahui Māori, commonly known as GGKM, um, has done an extraordinary job in keeping us on track and being supportive in every possible way after Jenny stepped down. And the other two pictures there are the two other deputy directors. Andrew was a deputy or is a deputy director for another two weeks. Um, uh, the other two, uh, Cleona and Parry, uh, and I wish to acknowledge them as well. Now, an incredibly important feature of everything we did in this challenge was collaboration with stakeholders right from the very beginning when we asked stakeholders what we should be doing, what was important for them. And stakeholders represent a very broad range of society. Clearly, Māori and Pacific community representatives were critical, and a lot of those conversations, the hui that you see there, involved community representatives. But they also involved healthcare providers, particularly Māori and Pacific healthcare providers, but also government. The uh, Director General of Public Health uh, was present. I'm not going to try and use this pointer because I'll go backwards if I do, I think. Um, but um, in addition to that, to that, that group that I've, groups that I've mentioned, those groups that I've mentioned, um, we talked to NGOs, all the relevant NGOs at some length, uh, international experts, and there was even an opportunity for people to respond online in a part of public consultation. The other group of people that were really uh, very important was our International Science Advisory Panel. And you can see them up there together with Jenny. Um, and I really would just like to pay particular uh, uh, note to uh, Professor Shishiriki Kumanyika, who was chair of the International Science Advisory Panel. Um, Shariki, uh, for those of you who don't know her, is a world authority on the epidemiology of um, non-communicable disease. But in addition to that, she is one of the champions of working towards equity uh, in the United States, equity of health outcomes. Equity, I might also say, for the role of women in health research and health care uh, in the United States. And I, can't, I couldn't resist asking Jean, who did all these beautiful slides. Everybody who knows me in the audience will know I didn't make those slides, so I may as well just <laughs> admit it in public. Uh, but I did ask Jean to put her quote on there, uh, which I think was one of the greatest compliments that we have ever received in terms of this uh, science challenge. But interestingly also, it wasn't only something that was noted by the International Science Advisory Panel that we really were working hard in trying to do something about achieving equity, but our researchers also experienced this feeling of what equity uh, meant 
um, what it was to undertake co-design in terms of research that was done and to work together. And I think that quote from Chris Print is also one which uh, we are very proud of. Now, as a result of all this, we developed a strategy. And the strategy really involved three themes. Theme one was all about prevention. And if one talks about prevention, one's got to talk about a population approach, an approach for the whole of society. If you're going to achieve equity, you have got to give special attention to those people that need, that, that are experiencing inequity in terms of health outcomes. So, of course, we wanted to undertake culturally sensitive uh, health interventions for Māori and Pacific. But we were also very aware that many of the advances in medicine and healthcare were coming through precision medicine. So we also wanted to work in that space. And so those were really our three themes in which we worked, all underpinned by the guiding principles that I've listed up here and, the and three research support platforms. And with that as a background, I'm simply going to give one or two examples from each of those themes, as well as some of the other areas in which we undertook research. Now, this incredible diagram, I'm not going to try and explain in detail, because I would certainly exceed my time by even more than I'm going to exceed it now. Um, <laughs> so um, I will just really mention that this, I think, is a good example, given th that what we eat is acknowledged unquestionably now as the most important modifiable determinant of the global burden of disease, even more important, believe it or not, now than cigarette smoking. But also, it is an important determinant of climate change and planetary, uh, the future of the planet. There was a project called Eat Lancet, which many of you will be aware of, which actually showed from a global perspective that dietary change can produce not only major health benefit, but is compatible with environmentally sustainable food supply and planetary health. But this was a global project, and furthermore, it involved the study of very substantial dietary change, which is unlikely to be achieved in the foreseeable future. So the project which I'm going to talk about, Sustainable Kai New Zealand, um, was involved uh, Christina Cleghorn, Cleo Nini Merku, who's here, Christina McKercher, and Andrew Reynolds, who's also here, and is the first country-specific research which involves modeling the effects of different dietary strategies, which were more acceptable to the people of Aotearoa than the Eat Lancet diet, and looking at the effect of these, modeling the effect of these changes on a whole range of health outcomes. Not only were the strategies associated with better health outcomes, which we expected, obviously, but lower cost for healthcare, a reduction in greenhouse gases, but in collaboration with our land and water national science challenge, the researchers also were able to show that the associated land use that was required to achieve these changes would enable environmental targets to be met without significantly influencing uh, uh, international export uh, and trade, uh, something which has been questioned. Um, in consultation with stakeholders, they, the researchers also identified some policies which could help shift the population towards a sustainable diet, healthy food policies in schools, for example, removing um, GST from core sustainable foods, and found that these, unsurprisingly, would result in cost savings as well as health benefits. The results have been presented to all relevant branches of government, to MPI, the Public Health Advisory Committee, the uh, Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, Climate Change Commissioner, and they've been presented at international conferences. So all we need is for them to be implemented. We wait with bated breath. The um, theme two, theme two, um, I'm going to give you two examples illustrated here. First one is described as Takaika Direct. Takaika Direct is based on a novel intensive dietary approach, which has been shown to produce remission of diabetes and prediabetes, and which was tested in a randomized control trial involving largely Māori and Pacific patients from Takaika. And the leaders, two of the leaders of that are here tonight. Uh, there's Andrew Reynolds and Justine um, were 
people who pioneered this particular project with a large group of other people, including Dr. Kim Maiai, who was uh, the medical officer in charge of Takaika at that stage. This particular intervention was found to be generally well received, despite being very challenging. And furthermore, the degree of weight loss resulted in appreciable cardiovascular risk reduction and blood glucose control in people with diabetes and prediabetes. How exciting to think that you can actually move towards preventing type 2 diabetes in people that have already developed this disease. Not Perhaps it's a bit strong to say preventing type 2 diabetes, but certainly producing remission and reduction of cardiovascular risk and improved blood glucose. Um, the second one I want to talk about is perhaps more at the prevention end of diabetes. And I make no, apologize for using, uh, no, no apologies for using diabetes as an example. I think most people here know I have more than a passing interest in that particular condition. <laughs> but it is the epidemic disease of our time. Um, the audit Tokaroa Family Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, this was masterminded by um, Riz Firestone uh, from Massey and Akarera Henry um, uh, from Swipix, which is a uh, specific uh, healthcare provider in Tokaroa. And it involved a family-centered empowerment model for diabetes prevention, as I've mentioned, which meant that um, family champions were trained to take a range of actions known to reduce uh, diabetes risk. Uh, food bags were provided. The family champions went back to their families and encouraged them to eat uh, together. Uh, food based on special cookery books which were prepared. And the results have been absolutely amazing in terms of increased knowledge, lifestyle change, local supermarkets now selling a range of appropriate foods, and other communities and programs that are now adopting this Oire uh, Tokaroa program. How exciting to think that we can actually produce remission of diabetes and we can really move towards action which prevents diabetes if only people will implement these. Finally, and I had a notice that I've got one minute left, and I'm going to take about three. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about precision medicine. Um, CTD, CTDNA for improving cancer diagnosis and monitoring, uh, again led by Perry Guilford uh, from this university and Chris Print and colleagues from Auckland. This has been a nine-year investment for the challenge. It was one of our initial projects and has continued up to the present time. The work involves bioinformatics, laboratory work, clinical studies, and engagement with both clinicians and the community. Notably, I might mention in terms of talking about the community through the work of Jordan Lima with Hernati Parofano in Tairafati. Work is particularly centered around bowel cancer and melanoma, and this ctDNA technology has now been clearly shown to be an accurate measure of tumor burden and response to treatment enabling decisions to be made from a simple blood test, decisions that would previously have involved people living peripherally coming to major centers uh, for complex investigations. So saving people an enormous amount of time and effort and money, and also saving the costs of healthcare. All to be made from a simple blood test, which is now believed to potentially also have value in diagnosis. Finally, just to uh, finish off, um, the challenge has been involved in a number of reports um, which uh, uh, have been uh, mentioned. Uh, Co-design uh, was mentioned by, by uh, Sir Jerry, um, which I think has really uh, made a huge impact in terms of persuading researchers what genuine co-design is all about. Everybody talks about co-design, but genuine co-design is something different. And I acknowledge uh, Amahir, who is sitting up there in the back row, uh, together with Debbie Goodwin, who produced this excellent piece of work. And finally, I just want to mention uh, the one on the far left there, the uh, cost of diabetes uh, report of type 2 diabetes, which was done in collaboration with um, the Edgar Diabetes and Obesity Research Centre and Diabetes New Zealand, which really showed what is ahead of us if we don't do something about the diabetes epidemic. And I'm pleased to say that it was one of the stimuli I, uh, uh, of um, Te Fata Ora and Te Akafai Ora um, to start working on a National Diabetes Action Plan, which we are still working on, and we hope that funding will be found to implement that particular uh, thing. 
In terms of implementation network, again, Targeri has mentioned our interest in work in implementation, so I won't spend any more time on it. Safe to say that uh, two, frame, uh, two different frameworks have been produced by researchers as part of their work uh, for the challenge. And one of the legacies which I hope will remain for the challenge is the implementation network. And I think I saw Diane appear um, somewhere. Uh, she's here somewhere. Um, but she's very much part of it, as are several other people. Um, and this is really an attempt to work with healthcare providers, particularly Māori and Pacific healthcare providers, who want to implement evidence-based research. So that is a very quick run through the sort of things we've been trying to do for the last 10 years, but I can't end without paying, as many have done already, um, tremendous uh, thanks and gratitude to the team which uh, was described at our meeting this afternoon by Lorraine Brooking as the engine room of Healthier Lives National Science Challenge. And you will see a couple of them here, um, but there are uh, others who have been uh, involved uh, but really, this team has been absolutely fundamental in everything we've done. So, apologies for going a few minutes over time, um, but um, I hope I've given you some idea of what Healthier Lives has been up to in the last nine years. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jim. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there'll be time at the, at the end of the four presentations for or questions. Uh, the next speaker I'm privileged to introduce is Dr. Karen Bartholomew. Karen is speaking on behalf of Professor Sue Kringle and will outline the implementation science research that Sue led, which focused on reducing the ongoing ethnic specific health inequities that persist in Aotearoa, New Zealand for Māori and Pacific peoples. And as an aside, um, Sue's presenting the research at a conference overseas. Sue's um, selected the right person to stand in for her. Dr. Karen Bartholomew is a public health physician and researcher. She's the Director of Health Equity and Service Innovation and Improvement at Health New Zealand. Her research focuses on screening health inequities and implementation science. If you look at the sorts of things that Karen is involved with, you'll understand why Sue has asked her to speak. She leads an HPV self-testing program, an endometrial cancer program, abdominal, abdominal aortic aneurysm research, and is a co-investigator for Te Oranga Pū Kahu Kahu, the Lung Cancer Screening Program. She's a medical doctor, has a microbiology degree, and has a Master of Public Health. Karen. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you very much to Healthier Lives and acknowledge Mana Whenua and Rangatira here for the opportunity to have a conversation with you. I don't know that anyone can follow Jim though, so I think that's a pretty hard task. Um, as Sir Jerry said, um, I'm going to be talking to you about this project up here, so particularly looking at inequities in the mainstream health services. And uh, presenting on behalf of Sue, most of you will probably know Sue, she's a force of nature and it's my absolute privilege to be working on this project uh, with her and under her leadership. And we've had such a fantastic team, you can see up there, on this project, um, really diverse expertise across the health system, uh, and absolutely fantastic project to be a part of. So kind of my role in this is Health New Zealand Te Whatu Ora Liaison, uh, and I'm also involved, uh, as Sir Jerry said, uh, with Sue in Te Oranga Pukahu Kahu, the Lung Cancer Screening Project, which you'll see sneaks in here uh, into the project. I can't talk about the project, though, without talking about health inequities. Uh, and I've just put this one up here, there's health inequities everywhere, as we all know, in all parts of the health system. I've put this one up here, life expectancy, because my team have just produced a report, which is going to come on the Health New Zealand website shortly, 
on this, which dives deep into the inequities in life expectancy. So I won't spend too much time on it, I promise, but you can't do public health and not have some graphs. Uh, so you can see up here, this is life expectancy for everyone, all ethnic groups going up over 20 years. Yay, that's good stuff. Uh, but you can see what we've got here is this is New Zealand European, this is Asian up here, up high, and then down here we have Māori down the bottom in purple and Pacific in blue. So we have big ethnic inequities in life expectancy. And this is the same thing but looking at that gap there, you can see the gap is coming down for Māori in purple, which is good, but it's a very long way to get to zero. And you can see here for Pacific, it's flat, so it's actually not closing that gap. So we have a lot of work to do in health, all of us, uh, which, which is why um, Sue and I are very passionate about health inequities and what the mainstream health services can do about this. I put this other graph on here because we have a lot of narrative at the moment about is it ethnic specific, is it socioeconomic, is there other things? We know all of those things are important and they intersect. But this graph really nicely illustrates uh, life expectancy by socioeconomic status. So this is the least deprived, the richest people up here, and this is the most deprived, the poorest people here. This is non Māori, non-Pacific, so there's a gradient from the richest to the poorest. But here for Māori, there's also a gradient, but you can see at every single level there is a difference between Māori and non-Māori for life expectancy. So we've got a lot of work to do in the health system, and that was kind of the impetus of this research. Uh, Sue and I worked together in the old days in the district health boards uh, up in uh, the northern region, and uh, we were seeing a lot of interventions in that work that were resulting in unequal outcomes. And worse than that, we were seeing um, interventions that were specific to increase equity, not achieving those results. Um, and we observed when we were having conversations with people that people really wanted to address inequities. They knew it was important, uh, but they were getting stuck on the how do we do it, which felt a bit strange because this is not a new concept. People have been doing this work for a very long time. Uh, but particularly in the hospital and specialist area, people said, we're stuck, we don't know how to do it. We need some guidance. So that's kind of how this work came about. And it also came about because in lung cancer screening program at the time, we were thinking about implementation science and we were using implementation science and there were some of those tools that we thought, hey, what if we did this from an equity perspective? How could those be more helpful? So I'm just going to mention briefly what implementation science is. Some of you may know all about it and some of you may not. Implementation science is an academic discipline, like academic disciplines, uh, but it's really about the fast track from research outcome to implementation with clinicians. That's what it's about. It's about the step between we're proving that it works through to implementing it. And it's all of the tools and the intervention strategies and the frameworks, and we like a bit of jargon, theories, models and frameworks, TMFs over here, to help us do that. And this discipline wasn't developed from an equity perspective, but could potentially be a tool for equity if we got that right. So that's where this came about, this particular project, uh, and huge thank you to Healthier Lives for supporting this. Um, and this work was very much supported by, uh, in um, reference to Sir Jerry's um, comments earlier, by a local Kahui Māori Ropu and also a consumer advisory group that helped support this work. There were three phases, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, I'm just going to talk about the starred ones. We did a whole lot of preparatory work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that preparatory work, and then I'm going to talk about the two tools that we developed. So. Um, Jim showed us before just a brief graphic of one of those frameworks, so I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, equity readiness tool. We also tested them in lung cancer screening, which is where lung cancer screening comes in, uh, and then we've done a whole lot of iterative development work and dissemination work. So I'm going to talk first about that framework, uh, which has a uh, new name you can see up there. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue as much as some of those uh, medical acronyms we try and get right, uh, but. It, um, it's really about effective, equitable implementation. And so we developed that with these kind of six steps, and I'm not going to talk about them in detail at all, but just to say it did involve literature reviews, it did involve talking to a whole lot of uh, equity experts and researchers, Māori researchers across the country. Uh, it involved looking at a whole lot of theories, models and frameworks, what's going to be helpful, including he picking a way order, which was mentioned earlier, and there's information over there. Uh, and mapped all that back, and then a lot of iteration and revision. 
So I'm just going to briefly mention the literature review, and we looked at 157 of these theories, models, and frameworks that are used internationally, and only 15 of them talk about equity in any way, and only 12 of those really do it any kind of justice. So there's definitely a need for this, and people are clearly wanting to do this internationally, but there's not much out there at the moment. Now, theories, models, and frameworks are divided into five categories. Not going to talk about that at all. Just to say that our one is a process model, and we chose that specifically because it's step-by-step -step guidance, and that's what our colleagues in the hospital system in particular said they wanted, step-by-step -step guidance. So that's what this is. So that's our new one is in here. Epiking Awaiora is in here. It's a determinants framework. Hopefully people have heard of that. It's a fantastic tool, very community-focused um, uh, implementation science tool as well. So we have two in New Zealand, which is fantastic. Uh, and then we use this one quite a lot here. It's one of the international ones. It's an evaluation one. So again, I'm not going to talk about this particularly, but there's the 12, if anyone's interested in them. Some of the big ones that people use. Uh, but what we actually decided to do was adapt one of the international ones rather than do our own. We debated that a lot about whether we do a new one or not, and we adapted one. And this is what it looks like. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about it. It's step-by-step -step guidance, as I said. It's in four sections that kind of follow logically. Uh, and it's got quite a lot of detail. It's comprehensive. So um, the outcome of using this is that you get an action plan for how to do it. Uh, and uh, a couple of things to note here. It's whānau aspirations and needs in the centre. That's really important. And it's grounded in tetiriti. So very, um, very much those themes that have already been talked about in terms of healthier lives. Uh, and there's a number of features in the middle here around collaborative design and people with lived experience and people experience in inequities being involved and uh, you progress around this way. What we found when we talked to people about stepping through this is that in this area here, people wanted to get some sense of, are we ready to do this? Can we actually implement this? How would we know? What does good practice look like? So we developed our second tool to fit that gap which is an equity readiness tool. And again, I won't spend too much time on this, but it's a very um, common concept in organisational psychology. Are we ready to do something? Organisation, is it ready? So it takes that concept, and, but it applies an equity lens to it. And again, we adapted an international tool uh, which had already been validated uh, for organisational use. And so what we're looking at is essentially a survey, but you're asking individuals to do the survey and you're asking them to look at themselves and you're asking them to look at their service, and you're asking them to look at the entire organisation and some elements of best practice across those things. And it's a facilitated discussion, and it's really important that it's facilitated because there's lots of nuance about having equity conversations. Uh, and the result of it is an action plan, and, and it needs to involve change. So you need the people who are accountable for this to be involved in order to successfully change. That's what it looks like if you want to see it. We've got a website coming soon so people will be able to use it. Uh, and it actually gives you an electronic output to each member of the team and across the team. So where are we now? So we've done all that development work. We've developed the tools. We've tested it in lung cancer screening. Rachel Brown, who's the CEO of National Whole Water Coalition and her team, did all of the data collection here. And that's just finished and it's fantastic. Uh, we've done a whole lot of revision. We've written some user guides and refined those through a stakeholder conversation with senior managers across a whole lot of health agencies, which was super helpful. And now we're on to dissemination. So just in summary from me, we've developed two tools for a very specific purpose. This is the mainstream health system getting its house in order about how it can do equity better. But that has to result in change because plans are all good, but change is required. So this is the work we're doing at the moment, is saying what do these have to look like? Who needs to be involved? How do we make sure there's change to projects? What does good equity practice look like? Modelling it, showing people that. And then how do we improve the sophistication of doing this across the organisation? So we've got the website coming. We're doing some train the trainer stuff. And it's quite exciting recently, the IHI, for those who know anything about quality improvement, like the Guru Organisation for Quality Improvement, they're really interested in these tools and how they can cross over with quality improvement and how we might be able to use those tools in both. So really excited about that. Kia ora. Thank you.